Hi, it's Noel Williams from Optimal Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, April 9th, COVID update. First, some house cleaning stuff just for anyone in the practice. We're only gonna be open tomorrow morning, so if you need anything, please call by 12. Uh, all the usual for refills and everything. The, if you need to order any supplements, please do so online. Um, we are doing telemedicine appointments so you can schedule those and we are still seeing new patients. So enough of that. So anyway, uh, happy birthday to two of my staff, Amy Brooks and Shannon Carmage, both uh, 29 still. And then Helen Willis, someone I work with at the hospital. Happy birthday, Helen, miss seeing you. Uh, so what's the update today? Well, it's about 1.6 million people now in the world, 95,000 dead. Um, United States about 169,000 and I think about infected about 16,000 dead. The thing to keep in mind about those numbers is if you start tracking information in Italy, you track information in New York, for example, they've had about 7,000 deaths. But if you look at the number of calls to EMS um, for death at home, um, they average about 25 of those a day across the five boroughs. Um, there was a day last week where they had 322, and if you look at total numbers of those calls over the last two weeks, or the la essentially the last two weeks, and comparing them to historical norms, um, the historical norm was 553 for those same two weeks of the year. Looking back several years, that was the average. And in that same two weeks, most recently it was 2,200 or 2,300. And that's the same thing that's been happening, happened in Italy. And what happens is a lot of people who are older or in nursing homes, they just pass. So again, uh, the recorded death rates are always gonna be lower, just like the recorded um, infection rates are always going to be lower. Now people worry that, oh, every single person who dies who's COVID positive um, is gonna, COVID's gonna be blamed. Well, figure, we're gonna be underreporting massively. And a lot of the people who happen to have heart disease die because of the COVID, or if you have lung disease, you already had it, but the COVID tipped you over. It, so it's the COVID causing it more than anything. Now the Oklahoma data, I couldn't really get any update on today. I tried um, a few minutes ago and the numbers were about the same as yesterday. So I'll report those when I can get them. I've texted several people to find out, um, but they didn't text in the five minutes I gave them. So, but we were at about 17, just shy of 1,780 and we were about the same yesterday and that's not realistic. We we're having way more cases than that. Um, but I think the key concepts that we're still going with is that the, the surge can be blunted if we stay at home. The surge can be blunted if you stay at home. That means traveling unnecessarily, going places, not wearing a mask um, is all detrimental. If you're looking at the number of people who are dying, that we're only behind Italy now um, in terms of the number of dead people. And so we'll be beating them before too long, unfortunately. So really, really suppress the wave. If you look at any maps again, you look at the disaster that's the East Coast versus the West Coast. The West Coast got their uh, shelter in place orders done first. The East Coast did not, so lo and behold, um, it's just not helpful. I think the Oklahoma State Health Department put out something today that was completely meaningless. It's called a syllogistic fallacy, which I've talked about before. It's what um, uh, sophistry, a, a um, philosophy at the time of Socrates, um, did where they would make any argument in, repetitively till it was thought to be valid even though it was untrue. And the Oklahoma Health Department today said, well, we've had 79 people die of flu and we've only had 79 people die of COVID and that helps keep it in perspective. It's utter nonsense. That's utter nonsense. It's 89 people in three weeks versus 89 people in seven months and there's a vaccine to prevent it. And we're not even coming close to catching all the people who've died. And when there's 700 people, which is the estimated number in Oklahoma by August 1st, and we hope it's only that little, which is still a bummer, um, I don't think comparing it to flu will be any less insulting than as it is to someone with a brain now who actually understands this disease process. So I actually get a little bit annoyed with syllogistic fallacies when you start to compare things that aren't alike and act like they are um, to try to diminish the importance of a conclusion of something you disagree with. And so uh, let's make honest arguments and not just promote ideas that aren't valid. Um, so let's talk about quinine. Quinine is related to hydroxychloroquine or uh, chloroquine itself. Um, it's an anti-malarial. The dose for malarial uh, 
treatment is about 700 milligrams three times a day. So why is this important or a question? Well, because quinine is thought to have similar properties to hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine itself in terms of being potentially inhibitory to COVID-19. Um, so the first thing is there's no direct data showing that. I think we can probably assume because it's a, I think it's a class effect, but there is not a shred of evidence I could find doing a literature search. Now there's evidence that quinine is inhibitory on multiple similar RNA viruses like um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are, but there's no data. So you gotta keep that in mind. And then people have asked about tonic water. Well, tonic water originally was just water with quinine in it, and it was an anti-malarial. So um, back in the day in India, in the 19th century, the British used that to treat uh, malaria. Well, it was a lot more <laughs> quinine, and it was actually completely unpalatable to taste or to drink, so they added sugar uh, to it and that made it much better. So that's where tonic water came from. Well, unfortunately, per liter of tonic water in the US, which is federally regulated, there's only 83 milligrams of quinine. So in order to get a just the equivalent of one dose of an anti-malarial level of quinine, you would have to drink somewhere in the range of eight and a half to nine liters of tonic water a day to just get a dose or 27 liters to get a full anti-malarial dose. That would cause you much greater problems than, than the COVID-19. So don't try to replace quinine with, uh, or do the quinine thing using tonic water. Uh, I think there's hydroxychloroquine around and I think it's something that if you're starting to get sick, the hydroxychloroquine is definitely something you wanna start if possible if you have a positive test or you've had an exposure with a positive test, test, but it needs to be done through a physician. Likewise, um, some compounding pharmacies in town are sending out um, scripts, automatic scripts for a combination of hydroxychloroquine with zith the Zithromax um, to tab on hand. Um, again, we're not, I'm not for that. I, my physician group was horrified by this. People don't understand that Yes, the Zithromax does probably help, but when you add hydroxychloroquine to Zithromax, you can prolong your QT interval, which is very important, in your heart rhythm, and you can get a malignant arrhythmia and it can kill you. So we are not recommending that uh, at all, um, uh, unless under the direct supervision of a doctor, and you really need to have a lot of reasons to go into that combination. So I, that's not something we're encouraging anyone to do. And that really we should start leaving that to disease expert management people before you just prophylactically start combining Zithromax and hydroxychloroquine. Now, in reading today though, uh, there was some interesting stuff. There's an article out of China that I found today on COVID and how it's actually working pathophysiologically to harm us. And the article talked a lot about, and it's the first article of its kind, so we have to see if it's reproduced but it talks about that the COVID-19 viral particle binds to red blood cells, affects the hemoglobin, and gets the iron out of the hemoglobin, which then affects the red blood cell, which is where the hemoglobin is, from carrying oxygen. So when you combine that with getting a significant lung infection or inflammation in the lungs, you need oxygen to be able to get into the lungs, the oxygen has to absorb from the inside of the alveoli, the little grape-like sacs that are in the lungs that are really teeny tiny, and cross into the bloodstream. If it's, there's a lot of fluid and inflammation, it's a wider distance for the oxygen to come through, so it's harder to get in. And then if you have a secondary event, which may even be a primary event in terms of just bad pathophys, is the red blood cells then don't have the correct formation of hemoglobin to carry oxygen. So normally when we breathe, the air goes in, it crosses from the alveoli into the red, or into the, your bloodstream, the red blood cells carry the oxygen. They're little trucks and they carry them all around. But if the 
back of the truck has been taken off and it can't carry the oxygen because the hemoglobin has been damaged by the COVID virus, that leads to further lack of oxygen in the system. So that could be one of the reasons why we get significant or more significant disease in some patients. Interestingly enough, there's some data that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine may directly interfere with that. So again, it points to the idea that hydroxychloroquine is potentially a great immediate intervention for people. There were some other, a couple other antivirals mentioned in the study, but I, I think the main thrust of it is there's more and more knowledge coming out. And so we'll have to follow, all of us will have to follow that data very closely, but it still seems to indicate that hydroxychloroquine's early use is probably a very good idea. Um, and doing anything like zinc, which is gonna knock down the viral particles, anything that decreases the initial viral replication is gonna be very important. Um, I got a, someone sent me an article first, it was Tina Telkachi, my uh, PA, um, sent me an article this morning, and then someone else did too, but I'm blanking, on Invermectin, which is the dog dewormer, which we've used, dog meant cancer patients, um, chemotherapy, or if someone was, had failed all their chemos and radiotherapy, we've used Invermectin successfully to extend life and to retard cancer. Well, there's actually some pretty cool papers coming out with Invermectin and, or Pancurin, Panicure, uh, for COVID-19. In one paper I found, there was direct evidence that it decreased the viral load in, tish, in a tissue culture by 5,000%. There's older data, because Invermectin's uh, anti-parasitic too. Um, they're anti-parasitic, so you have hydroxychloroquine, uh, anti-malarial, you have an anti-parasitic now. Um, so these are the kinds of drugs that try to kill invasive things in our bodies. And so the Invermectin data is starting to look pretty good. Uh, but again, very, very early, but that's also exciting news for um, people that there's gonna be more and more treatment options ahead. So that's all very exciting. Um, a couple other little things. Uh, I think we're heading into the peak over the next two weeks in Oklahoma City. Uh, we really, really, really wanna focus on staying at home, uh, following the guidelines, listening to um, Secretary Shrum and Secretary Lawfridge's remarks, and of course, David Chansome, who's now been on at the press conference. I mean, they, these people really know what they're doing, and we have to trust them and believe in them to provide the best care. Um, for a bunch of nurses and support staff have continued to email me that all the hospitals are short of N95 masks, the, the reusable, or not, sorry, the non-reusable formal ones. Um, that you've seen probably in different places. If you have any sitting on your shelf, please, please, please bring them to your local hospital. It doesn't matter if it's Norman Regional, Midwest City, any of the Integris centers. And a big shout out to Integris today because they had to um, uh, have some furloughs today of their most wonderful staff and their, some of their administrators. And they've really overachieved and are doing the right things. They're not doing elective surgeries. They're, they've set themselves up to be a center of excellence for our whole entire community. So we really need to be thinking about the staff people at Integris and praying for the Integris family uh, because of these tough times. And again, Saints, Mercy, um, any of those hospitals, OU of course, any of the big hospitals need more supplies, but again, it needs to be the formal kind, not just um, the uh, a face covering. They can use those too, but they really need the N95 masks and then Midwest City and um, Norman Regional also absolutely needs uh, materials and I'm sure both heart hospitals would appreciate, um, or all the heart hospitals would appreciate more N95 masks if you happen to have some and live nearby. Uh, so that's really the update for today. Uh, there's some new science coming out with uh, why COVID attacks or, or rather how it attacks and some new interventions. Um, everyone take your zinc. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, it's the most important thing. Number two, uh, the melatonin, because it interrupts the inflammatory cascade. Three, a multivitamin, a strong, potent multivitamin that can get your immune system rubbed up in addition to the zinc. And then finally, vitamin D is always a benefit. Those are your core four things. I think adding a lot of, besides that, um, there's not as much science, so let's stay with the science, and it's important. So that's my final comment is science matters and truth matters. So good night and take care.